Welcome to our Film Ireland podcast. Our guest in this episode is author and screenwriter Alistair Owen. Alistair is going to be discussing his new book, The Art of Screen Adaptation, which features a series of insightful interviews with 12 of today's top screenwriters. Alistair will also be talking about his own take on screenwriting, as well as his friendship with Bruce Robinson and the book he wrote with the man 20 years ago, Smoking in Bed. You've also um, written a novel and uh, you've written a few screenplays yourself so i know this is yes partly how you got inspired you were kind of asked to do this so maybe we could talk about your own screenwriting did you as a writer where did you see yourself going did you plan on becoming a screenwriter or a writer um back in the day i mean when i first got into movies you know sort of between the age of about 15 and 20 when i hoovered up movies at an alarming rate i wanted to be a director um i directed play at school i directed a, a couple of shows at university I swiftly worked out that at that point I wasn't especially good at working with actors, which I felt was a bit of a demerit for a director. So I, I rethought that slightly. Um, it hasn't stopped screenwriting... many directors. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite. Some of the stories you hear about the way um, directors treat actors are you know, truly shocking. Um, True. And um, so I, I sort of refocused a bit. Um, I'd already done a bit of writing for my own amusement. Um, there was a, a book for young adults by the, um, the, the the novelist Robert Westall, which I'd made. I've made about three cracks at and I've not managed to um, deal with yet but for my own amusement, just to teach myself the craft. Yeah. So um, when I sort of put directing to one side, screenwriting seemed logical. Um, I then, uh, the way I taught myself, I never really, I never, I, did, I didn't, I studied drama at Bristol, but drama at Bristol was a very much an academic course, really. There were practical elements, but not practical screenwriting. Um, and I sort of, and I didn't read, didn't take any screenwriting courses. I didn't read any screenwriting books at that point. I came to those much later. Um, what I did was, um, because there was books, clearly adaptation was something that had already seized me quite early on. There were a couple of books that I'd read as a you know, teenager, late teenager that had really stuck with me. And so I just, I had a crack at adapting them for my own amusement, really. Um, one in particular, a, a wartime thing by Neville Shute, I did, I don't know, seven or nine drafts over the course of several years. Um, and I got that to a point where um, I, I actually showed it to a couple of the writers who I interviewed in my second book, which was an anthology of interviews with British screenwriters. And they were incredibly complimentary about it. Um, I couldn't really do anything with it, um, and if anyone um, uh, listening to or watching this has this question, um, because adapting a book you don't own the rights to is an absolute no-no. Um, <laughs> I was lucky that I had people I could show it to, you know, really good people, and there was a brief moment where an, an agent did sort of take it shopping very, very, in a very It had its value. It was a thing. huge learning curve. It absolutely was, and, and I think the the moment that I realized it had been a learning curve was when the screenwriter Hussein Amini, who won a, um, was nominated for an Oscar for Wings of the Dove, and it was in both my second anthology, Story and Character, and this one, The Art of Screen Adaptation, was when he said to me, you seem to have figured out something here that took me years to learn in terms of scene construction of scenes, which is essentially um, enter the scene as late as possible and leave it as early as possible. In other words, and I, I thought, I think he also said, you know, you're not writing stuff, which it took me a long time to figure out that you need to just not write, you know, or it just gets cut. Um, and that was a really useful lesson, actually, um, because far better, like, plenty of directors are like this. Cronenberg is a good example that Christopher Hampton cites in the course of, again, the course of the new book, um, to make his, he prefers to do his editing on the page. Yeah. In other words, if you don't need it, don't write it, don't shoot it. Much more painful to write it, shoot it, and then have to cut it. And I think that's, you know, so that taught me a great lesson. But so adaptation is where you started writing, and you've written the original script as well. And you're I asked, have. Sorry, go on, tell me some more about that. Um, I've done, I've done, I've done uh, three to three um, original scripts. Um, originals took me a lot longer to sort of teach myself, really. And, and to be absolutely honest, I'm not sure I've ever quite cracked it. Um, the script I'm proudest of, uh, again, which, you know, maybe it'll come back to life one day, um, was actually a rewrite of another writer's script. Um, one of the author, uh, screenwriters in Story and Character, my second book, um, a guy called Rupert Walters, um, 
who at the time I had done him had comparative uh, time I interviewed him had, had comparatively recently adapted Rose Tremaine's novel Restoration with Robert Downey Jr. Okay. Um, and he and I got on well and I um, at a certain point cheekily said you know she fancy collaborating on something and bearing in mind he was a, a produced agented writer and I was neither of those things but nonetheless he, he took that seriously um, and at a certain point I, I pitched a historical idea to him and apropos of that idea he sent me a script that he'd already written a spec script some time ago that hadn't gone anywhere and I read it it's a, a sort of historical epic set in 1605 and it's a tremendously strong story but at the same time in a bit like when you read a book and you, you think oh, oh I, okay I could see how you might sort of reversion that or rework that in order to make that work possibly a bit better. I felt that about his script and he was generous minded enough to, to feel that I might be able to bring some value. So I spent some time researching, I spent some time writing it, I spent a year or so doing rewrites, got it to a point where he was happy with it, his agent was happy with it. I managed to get myself an agent of it, which was I was thrilled by that's right. a major hurt for any writer. Um, and uh, we sent it out into the marketplace. Um, garnered some fantastic feedback, um, but it's it's period, and period is very hard to land these days. Even if you're, you know, a significant writer, um, it's expensive. It's it's quite male dominated. Um, it would be a very tricky one to get off the ground. Um, Rupert at one point said to me when we were working, like, what does this? What is this script like? And I'm normally very good at that. I'm normally too good at that. I'm normally able to say, oh, yeah, it's X meets Y. It's, I always love the one that um, the writer in the player, when he's pitching to Tim Robbins, it's, it's Ghost meets the Manchurian candidate. I love that kind of thing. And I'm always usually, I've, got, I've usually got that in my head, um, which has sometimes been a problem with my writing, that it is too generic, that it lacks its own identity. In this case, I was stumped, really. And the closest I could get was, well, it's sort of a bit like Rob Roy meets The Mission. Two of the, I think, finest films ever made. Good pitch. <laughs> uncompromising, difficult material. Um, whereas another one I've got, the Robert Westall one, my pitch would be it's The Terminator meets The Crucible. Now, I think that's a much better <laughs> pitch. <laughs> yeah, um, so you'd, you'd have a lot of executives scratching their heads and they'd be afraid that they miss something and they'd go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um so I did that, um, and um, and then sort of alongside that, um, when that didn't go anywhere, um, I'd been I'd been wanting to write a novel for a long time, um, and I sort of I didn't have the confidence to do it. Um, you know, screenplays limit 120 pages. You don't have to write prose in the same way. I mean, some writers do. Yeah. There are some fantastic. Obviously, we know there are some fantastic screenwriters who. They're, they're just great writers and they happen to work in in movies. Um, Bruce Robinson is a good example. It was no surprise to yeah. me um, that he ended up writing a novel because if you read his screenplays, The Killing Fields, for example, or even Whitnall, they're extremely novelistic. Um, but I'd always wanted to write a novel and um, an idea just had occurred to me that I'd originally considered writing as a screenplay, film script, decided to tackle it as a novel instead uh, wrote it in short chapters, decided it was going to be a novella, so it wasn't too, you know, scary a thing to look at, chipped it off over the course of a year, um, and and put it put it up on Kindle myself, because to be honest, a, a cross-genre novella from a first-time fiction author is not what publishers are falling over themselves to, to it's publish. It's very hard but... to get published. I mean, they don't want the novel... They want a series of novels. They want a 10-year plan for, and one great book to start that off. So it is hard. I, I have it on my list. It's on, I, I bought it yesterday. I'm looking forward to reading it this week. So, oh, yeah. lovely. Good. Hope you enjoy it. Well, I'll get back to you. I'll be wanting my 99p back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a mechanism for I'm sure I'm going to look Sorry. it. But tell me this. Um, writing it as a novel, as you said, you made the choice of, uh, well, you wanted to write a novel anyway, but do you see it as a potential film? Would your brain well, start adapting? How did you shut that part of yourself off when you're writing the novel? Very good question. Um, and uh, I don't think I had to shut it off. I think it shut itself off naturally. Um, when I'm writing a screenplay, I normally have what I call, I don't like outlines and I don't like treatments. I find them devastatingly dull. 
um, and and in a sense, the fact that I've never, you know, I have done some commissioned work, but not a great deal. Um, a, my work other than that has been spec of one kind or another, even with the author script, you know, be it that there was a script already and, a, and another writer there. And there is a luxury there. You can take your time. You can attack it in whatever way you like. You know, Rupert didn't say to me, do an outline. Actually, Rupert did say to me, do an outline. And I said, well, no, I'm just going to tell you now on the phone what I'm going to do with it. And if you don't like it, I won't do it. And he said, fine, do that then. Um, so I've never really had to engage with these. I mean, Sarah Phelps talks in the Art of Screen adaptation about how whenever she hears a, a, about a fellow writer doing like the third draft of, or fourth, fifth or sixth draft of their outline or treatment, her soul dies for them. So I don't write, I have tended not to write out, outlines and treatments for scripts because I haven't had to, because they're not commissioned. I have the luxury to be able to just jump in and find the story and the characters by writing. But what I always have is what I call a beat sheet. Um, I got this from reading the Schrader on Schrader, um, the Faber book, um, and it actually reprints one of his beat sheets in there. And it's literally one sheet of paper, and he summarizes each scene or sequence as, you know, a, a very simple description. If you look at it, it might look like a DVD inlay, you know, with the track list. It's very simple. It's all on one page. If you decide that, you know, this scene here actually needs to go down there, you draw an arrow and you rearrange it, you put it in your three axes right there on one sheet of paper, it's lovely. You tick them off as you go. I didn't even do that with the novel. I knew what the opening was. I had the opening line and scene in my mind. I knew roughly where it was going to end up. And that's it. I just started writing. Um, I let the characters decide really where it was going to take me. And, you know, there were days when I would get up and I would, you know, sit down and start doing my writing. And they would say and do things that I had no conception that they were going to say and do that day. That's never happened to me before. and It's absolutely thrilling. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's great, you know, it's really, it feels, I, the, the mistake I made uh, with, with some of my original screenplays, um, they feel like screenplays, they read like screenplays, they're structured like screenplays, but the characters lack interior life. And the reason for that is because they're genre pieces that are driven by genre, driven by plot. In other words, sort of the definition of melodrama, which is story driving character, where rather than drama, which is character driving story. The vetting officer and the novella was the first time I really felt like I, I'd conceived of a character and I kind of knew who he was and what his dilemma was and what his backstory was. And him trying to figure his way out of this dilemma or, um, you know, um, arc his way away from the tragedy in his past was the drama that I was telling. Um, and then the structure found itself. I didn't anticipate writing it in three parts, but it is in three parts, but they're not the kind of three parts that would naturally adapt for TV. Part one is set in the present, part two is set in the past, and part three interweaves the past and the present. I'm not sure it would adapt in that way. And as I was writing it, I wasn't even thinking about whether it would adapt in that way. What I was thinking was, bloody hell, I really love this structure. I don't know where this came from, but I'm really enjoying it. And I would enjoy reading it were I a reader. And ultimately, I think that's the test. Are you writing something you yourself would want to read or you yourself would want to watch? You can spend far too much time thinking, will the audience like this? Will the audience understand this? And if I'd been writing it, with an adaptation in mind, whether that was a film adaptation or a TV adaptation, I really think that I might have made different, less good choices in order to facilitate an adaptation that may never happen. Much, much better to have the novella that works in the way that you want it to work within its own medium, and then further down the track, think about whether it, whether it would adapt or not. Um, I think I probably need to give it a bit more time before I consider whether to adapt it or not. Um, I think it would, uh, probably now. It's, it's, it's got very few characters. You can certainly shoot it in a socially distanced manner, I think. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of its themes of um, official secrets and personal sacrifice seem sort of oddly more current than when I was writing it. Um, but it was fascinating to me to do it because then it meant that when I came to do the book, The Art of Screen Adaptation, I now felt like I'd done both sides of the coin. I'd written prose fiction and I'd written screenplays and I'd written screenplays based on prose fiction. So to be able to, you know, sit down with all these fantastic writers and know what I was talking about, I think it was actually a real unexpected benefit. One thing I loved about the book is um, how there's contradictions and there's totally different opinions 
And they're not going to give you some magic kind of formula for you to go off and write your own book. You have to have that no. energy yourself. But there's Agreed. great guidelines and methods. And one was the lovely argument over treatments. But I found yes. that mostly it was novelists and playwrights that hated treatments. <laughs> and that made sense to me. I think that's me. true. But I, I do, I, I, I kind of write treatments. It took me a long time to get into writing treatments. And I find I agree and, and I struggle with them, but I also write them in such a way that I feel this could be the first draft of the script. I just need to use it as my template. And I will try and write in a prosaic fashion if I can now and again. As you said, like you, you hear all this thing about, oh, just write what's on the surface. If it ain't on the stage it ain't on the page kind of school of thought and I, no everything should be embraced sometimes you need that lyrical language to evoke a mood that ex might exist that you can't show agree. in someone sitting down and looking out the window you know yeah no i i completely agree with that and um one of the writers that i um uh, interview in this book and and interviewed in story and character again i mentioned hussein amini he very much believes that too um if you read if you read James Salis's novel Drive, it's yes. it's the quintessential hard-boiled um, noir style, very kind of you know um, a modern equivalent of yeah, um, Dashiell Hammett's and um, Raymond Chandler. Salis name checks a lot of the more recent hard-boiled writers like you know Richard Stark and so forth in the book, and you read it and you think, oh well, you know this would make a very you sort of read like a screenplay on the page, you know, short paragraphs, punchy description. Uh, hard-boiled dialogue and then you come to read Hussein Amini's screenplay page one and it's really quite dense and he's, he's describing in some detail mood and atmosphere mm -hmm. and it's a car he the driver's in a car and well so well he should be the film is called Drive um, so you know Hoss sets out the stall of the movie in that in that scene um, and um, but considering what he is writing is a car chase he's writing a car chase in a very character driven and mood driven way and you know, some some screenwriting gurus or man might tell you not to do that. Um, I mean, in a sense, I think I think whatever works really. I think I think limiting yourself and saying you can't do that is possibly not a good idea. Try it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, do something else. But well, the one thing it absolutely should be is a fantastic read. Whether that is, you know, if you look at it's not an adaptation, but if you look at the um, the script for Alien, for example. Um, I think uh, David Geiler and Walter Hill, um, they write that in a way not a lot of screenwriters would, one single line per sentence. So it's very sort of staccato. Um, Hosses is the exact opposite of that. And both work in their ways. So, you know, however you want to find your screenwriting voice, I think. What were the biggest surprises that came out of the working on this book and talking to the various uh, writers for you? Surprises. Hmm. I suppose I, I've, I've interviewed write quite a lot of writers over quite a long time now. So, um, and, and I tend to have a pretty good idea of the writers I'm talking to before I talk to them. I love, you know, partly because that's why I'm interviewing them. They'll tend, generally tend to be writers that I admire or have written something that I really want to talk to them about. And I'll do my research, usually just primary research, which is, you know, reading the scripts, as I say watching the films, um, reading the, obviously reading the source material. Um, I don't think there was anything that came out that surprised me greatly, possibly that, that, that so many of them were opposed to writing outlines and treatments, but that was, that was more heartening than surprising because it kind of reinforces a, but again, to an extent, I think if you're, um, I am aware that, you know, there will be people reading this book that are both seasoned writers and will read it, you know, out of interest, or maybe they, you know, they're quite interested to hear what some of these people might have to it's, say. It's but... worth marking now, by the way, that this book is not just for people wanting to adapt screenplays. Anyone who is interested in writing at all should read this book because it's about, it's about writing, full stop. Well, yes, because, you know, and quite a, one of my first set question, or one of my first set questions is, um, uh, is there a, are different creative gears engaged in writing adaptations yes. through writing original screenplays? And the most common answer, as I recall, from across the dozen interviewees is actually no. They sort of broadly use the same um, the same facilities. You're still having to wrestle with story and character. It's just that, you know, you're presented with the story and character, but rather than creating from the ground up, you're actually having to make choices about losing stuff. Um, you know, what, what do I need to keep? What do I need to lose? What do I need to reshape? And then, of course, you get into really interesting areas of, you know, you've, you've, you've been 
which can drive um, viewers and fans of novels absolutely spare. Um, you've got a 350 page novel. Um, you've got two hours of film time or three hours of TV time. And not only has the writer, the screenwriter, cut your, some of your favorite scenes and dialogue, they've actually invented new scenes and dialogue of their own. Why have they done this? Well, clearly, you know, if you're adapting, let's say, a whodunit, a, carefully, a careful Swiss watch of a, of a construction on the page, and you've sliced out certain characters or scenes or plot details to make it work within a, a, a briefer time constraint you are probably going to have to make up new stuff in order to you know um link together your your new creation i was thinking of sarah phelps because um she doesn't feel she's enthralled to the source material she picks projects that contain within them a story she wants to tell now whether that ends up being quite the same story that the novelist wanted to tell is sort of beside the point um and she writes the kind of adaptations that are likely to have purists devotees of the novel, people that come in wanting to see um, either some faithful rendition of their beloved book or uh, something that's occurred to me since doing the book. Um, I, I, I do sometimes feel that people, it's not so much that when people get upset about adaptations being travesties of the book, that they are actually fans of the book or indeed are even terribly familiar with the book. What they may be familiar with, however, is previous adaptations of the book. Now, if you take something like Great Expectations, previous adaptations of Great Expectations, they may have varied in length wildly, and I, I, I can't think how long the David Lean film is, but I doubt it's more than about an hour and 45 minutes. Whereas, you know, you've got BBC adaptations over the years that, you know, are several parts, four or five hours or whatever. Nonetheless, quite a lot of the adaptation choices made, or some of the key, um, you know, like the greatest hits, you might say, of Dickens, The Aged P, um, Joe Gargery, you know, what larks pick, um, uh, and, and indeed um, the, the fa famous opening with, with Magwitch, do you know what Vittles is, do you know what a file is, and you know, one of the first things Sarah Phelps does in her brilliant adaptation of Great Expectations is she reduces that line of dialogue by half, Magwitch no longer says, do you know what Vittles is, and do you know what a file is, he just says, do you know what a file is, Reason being, um, Pip goes back to the forge, nicks the file out of fear. The food, he adds to the order uh, out of the goodness of his heart. And it's that, it's the fact that Pip did something out of kindness, not out of fear, that sticks with Magwitch, that makes him do what he does, which has those ramifications all those years later. And you can't help feeling occasionally with an adaptation that the original novelist might see the way the screenwriter has, has, you know, done something to their work and think, hmm, I think I missed a trick there. <laughs> and that is a brilliant example of it. And I, it's one of the most emotional adaptations of Great Expectations. Was it Sarah who talked fondly of Oliver Reed, uh, her memories of yes. seeing Oliver? Yeah. I yes. thought that she, she was very funny because what I like about Sarah was, um, as you say, she had this energy and no fear of anybody. And she no. would, sacred cows are in trouble. No, nope. <laughs> around <No>. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to get slaughtered. Um, I'm so glad that I, I, I arranged the um, interviewees alphabetically. It was just easier for me to do that. And then I didn't have to give it any thought and it seemed fairer. But I'm sort of really glad that Sarah Phelps came last alphabetically because she does end the, the book on us fantastically. The days of the, of the great cinema adaptation are kind of 60s and 70s and they kind of fallen away really uh, if you go one of these good stuff you'll see it on television and streaming yes jeremy brock one of the other writers in the um in the book he said the um the, the film landscape has changed absolutely totally from when he first entered the, the business about 20 years ago um and you know I, even i can see that just as a, as a viewer when a film like the goldfinch for example is released uh, john crowley directed from a script by peter strawn from a novel by donna tart you know this would have been back in the day and i suppose by the day i'm thinking the era of things like the english patient this would have been a big prestige award-winning probably quite commercially successful literary adaptation um and now you are as you say you're seeing that kind of thing on TV. I mean, another good example, um, which again happens to have been written by one of my interviewees or, or um, co written, uh, was The Alienist from the Caleb Carr novel. That book was first optioned when it was in galley proofs by, I think, the producer Scott Rudin. And I understand went through a, a succession of um, 
high priced Hollywood screenwriters trying to um, wrestle this very thick 19th century New York set crime novel into a sort of two, two and a half hour feature and it defeated all of them. Um, and with good reason, it, it's it very dense in terms of detail and period and plot and character. And then comes along, you know, Netflix, Amazon, TNT in this case, is where it first aired, it's now, on, it's now on Netflix. You've got 10 hours of material. In fact, now you've almost got an opposite problem, which is yeah. even a book of 450 pages, you're looking at 10 hours worth of telly, you've probably got to expand from the book outwards. Um, and of course, you've got all the, the questions of um, each episode, does each episode have a theme? Does each episode have its own story in addition to continuing stories? You know, do, I would like to do a separate book actually just on long form telly because it's a fascinating area. Did you talk much about work habits? Some of that comes out along the way. I mean, you know, you do get an insight into that with the Do You Keep the Novel by You question. I, I loved Sarah Phelps's answer to that, where she, um, she, was it that one or an answer to another question where she said, well, that sort of implies a kind of desk that I simply don't have. And she described the kind of desk she does have. I did more of that in my second anthology, Story and Character. Um, I suppose because this was originally pitched to me as a how-to book, um, mm -hmm. as in I would have sat down and told people how to adapt. There was no way I was going to do that. I'm not remotely that arrogant. Um, I hope I'm not. Um, I pitched it back to Creative Essentials and said, well, look, you know, I'm not going to do that, but why don't I find 12 other guys, and, and, you know, screenwriters, um, not just guys, happily. Um, lovely that in this book, I was able to do what I wasn't in story and character, which is make sure that the gender, it's not quite gender balance, would have been better if one yeah. writer hadn't had to drop out. But that was nice that it, I was able to have, you know, almost as many women as men in there. Um, but I'll get, I'll get some great screenwriters and they'll, tell you how to do it but because it was therefore focused rather more tightly than my previous anthology and of course what I did have the benefit of is um, I did interview them most of them in their own not all of them but some of them in, in their own homes or in their offices so you kind of get a sense of of them as 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 people and I hope that comes across too because obviously as an interviewer one responds in different ways to different people um and you get sort of different feeling on the page and i hope that comes across uh, definitely uh, you, you hear voices and you, you feel a relaxed sensibility coming from them dealing with you you know and that, that's a that's a big deal i mean everyone forgets how much work goes into an interview when i did my first book which was a book of uh, interviews with bruce robinson um i did so much research because i'd never done it before and i wanted to you know it's for bloomsbury a big publisher it was a very big deal for me uh, I was down at the BFI library, I was reading everything, I did reams, stacks of photocopies of every review of The Killing Fields, you know, I read through it all. I had so many questions. Um, and I sort of did that to a lesser extent with the second book, Story and Character. By the time I got to my third book, a book of interviews with Christopher Hampton, I looked at his vast body of work as a screenwriter and a playwright, and I thought, if I if I do that for this, if I read every review of every play and every screenplay, and and this is, you know, he's he's written God, God knows how many unproduced screenplays, never mind the produced ones. So I just I said to myself, okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to forget secondary research. It's going to be primary research. I am going to read the source material. I'm going to read the screenplays, and I'm going to watch the films or tv series that have been made and i am then going to write down the questions that i would want ans answering as a moderately intelligent reader or viewer or fan of christopher hampton's work you know i'm i'm, I'm not a theater person particularly it's um, ironic i've worked on the fringes of theater for, for quite a while um but uh and here was i doing a book of interviews which was with um one of the foremost playwrights of our age um so I just thought, well, you know, he's an incredibly bright bloke. Um, there are very few people, you know, if you were to get daunted by it, there are very few blokes more than, more than Christopher Hampton in terms of intellect that you would think, you know, maybe Tom Stoppard would daunt you even more. I was quite, um, I was quite daunted interviewing David Hare because he is a ferociously intelligent man, a uh, brilliant writer, but happily a big fan of my Bruce Robinson books. So, you know, there's a kind of common ground there. Um, but no, I would ask the questions that I would want the answers to, and if that occasionally makes me look like a bit of an idiot, well, fine, I'll take that. Otherwise, you won't learn anything. <laughs> well, quite, absolutely. There's a wicked sense of humour in, in there. 
<laughs> there is very dry um doesn't suffer fools is my impression um but the reader and the hours are um you know he does he does take on quite difficult projects um neither of those is easy in any way shape or form and another great case study the hours it's a multi-character book um three time frames um and some of the subsidiary characters within each time frame are almost as important as the three female leads um and you've got to find space for all that and um i think it's probably one of the most faithful in its way although it makes quite sweeping changes it has to in its way i think it's one of the most faithful adaptations you'll you will come across atonement is another one and that's a very interesting journey um I first talked to Christopher about atonement when we did Hampton on Hampton and at that point he'd written um a draft or two for Richard Eyre who was on board to direct it at that point um then Richard Eyre left to make notes on a scandal and was replaced by Joe Wright often at that moment a screenwriter will exit stage left and the new screenwriter will come in as it happened Christopher remained with the project because he 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 and Eyre had effectively had to pitch to um Ian McEwen to get the gig. Um, I think McEwen auditioned writers and directors and they got the they got the gig. So Air left, oh. Christopher remained, entered Joe Wright, who essentially wants to go back to the book. Um, he, he Christopher had, had written an adaptation which employed a structure not dissimilar to um, Harold Pinter's structure for his screenplay of um, The Go-Between with a sort of flashback structure. Um, and I remember reading that draft and thinking it was, you know, very impressive. Christopher is a huge fan of, um, of Harold Pinter's screenplays, adaptations. Mm -hmm. And Joe Wright came in. He loved this this very difficult structure that the book has with this sudden switch from English country house to um, retreat from Dunkirk. Um, and he wanted that retained. And then you have the third section of the book as well, which is a, another sort of jarring moment. And rather than try and finesse those, the... Uh, jarring moments he wanted them very much front and center in the adaptation so christopher had to rethink but actually um ultimately i i, I think christopher always you know felt that that was the right journey to go on and that it was a rare example of an adaptation moving slowly closer to the novel rather than farther away and it's a film that over time has really grown on me i was a little bit nonplussed by it the first time i saw it i sometimes i think the great films take a few viewings especially adaptations if you've got talented mr rip another one is there any book that you feel that could never anyone could ever do justice to it as a film, even in its own right as a film? Every time I do one of these things, <laughs> publicity interviews, I'm asked I, one I, I, I'm actually you asking for me. me. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I, I think if you were given the right medium, um, then most things are probably susceptible to adaptation. Yeah. You may just have to be, I mean, all right, people said that Perfume was unadaptable, for example. The Patrick Suskin's novel, which um, was turned into the film with um, Ben Whishaw. Here's a novel which is about a serial killer in 18th century France. Um, and he is trying to capture scent. He is killing women in order to capture their scent, right? Now, that's hard enough on the page, but at least you've got description. You can describe stuff. How on earth do you do that on screen? Now, it's not a film about scent. Scent is a metaphor. And there we go. There's, some, there's problem number two. You're making a film about a metaphor. How do you make a film about a metaphor where, that, where, the met where scent is the metaphor? It's actually a metaphor for obsession and it's a metaphor for love, I think. He spends the whole movie thinking that what he's trying to capture is the scent of these women. He's not. What he's trying to capture is love, the one thing he can never capture. Um, so unadaptable book, right? Wrong. Because um, the director, Tom Taikwa, um, co-writing with the producer, Bern Eichinger, and um, the British writer, Andrew Birkin. And the opening scene of Perfume, in my opinion, is a masterpiece. I mean, the whole film is a masterpiece. But the opening scene is, it makes you, it is, it is unbelievably visceral, first of all, the, the, right. the birth of um, Gren Grenouille in this filthy market in the middle of Paris. He achieves, by use of sound effects, by use of fast cutting, close-ups, um, choice of shots, music, voiceover, a, a, a 
it's one of the best voiceover voiceovers in the movies. I love voiceovers. Quite a lot of the people in my book don't seem to. I think they're great. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's an omniscient voiceover by John Hurt, who's not even a character in the movie, which again I love. Um, Barry Lyndon does that. Um, the assassination of Jesse James does that. The opening scene in that film is absolutely repellent in absolutely the best way because you know his birth is repellent and he's surrounded by smells and you can just about smell those smells coming off the screen. Um, so I don't think I don't think I think most things can be adapted. Name of the Rose. And that went through a parade of screenwriters, so it's quite impressive that we wound up with something that, that kind of really worked. But what they've had to do there is they have taken a very big book, which is as much philosophy as it is murder mystery, and they have more or less stripped out the philosophy. They have billeted that book for its story. It's, it's Sherlock Holmes in a Franciscan Abbey uh, in the middle of nowhere at the end of the you know, what is it, 14th century or 12th or 13th century. Um, and on those terms, if you're not a fan of the book, or indeed even if you are, but approach the movie in the right way, there is no other film that conveys what the Middle Ages must have felt like better than The Name of the Rose. Um, uh, Black Death came close, uh, another film which had a, a, a fantastic opening and closing voiceover. Um, uh, so I think if you take a bold choice with it, then you can do it. Now, whether that's going to please people that loved all the philosophy in the Echo book, including Echo, yeah. clearly not. What's beautiful about that adaptation is it verges into a genre world in terms mm. of the detective story, and yet it has all those other clothes. And I love films like that, that defy you to, to put them into a slot, and you can't Well, in a sense, if you're very clever, um, or if the book is very clever and you fill it in a clever way, genre becomes your coat hanger uh, on which to hang a bunch of much more interesting stuff. Or if you put it a different way, it's, it's the sugar that makes the pill go down. Um, I, I mean, I, I, like, I, I love genre. As I say, I think I've spent too much time trying to write in genre without enough um, uh, care and attention to the characters operating within it. Um, but I think if used in the right way, uh, genre can be, can be great. And sometimes you can do that within within adaptation. I mean, I think, I think I think probably adapting most books, you have to, I certainly would probably think about what genre it was in, whether that would influence the writing, yeah. I don't know. Well, I said, if, if you can't get the characters right, a lot of the time is you, you're not going to get the rest of it right anyway, because it is all about hanging out with the characters. It's absolutely about, it's 100% about that. They are the alpha and the omega of, of any of any screenplay. I don't care what genre it's in. Um, if you know, I've, I've been I've been in lockdown now for some time, so I've been working my way through my DVD collection and slinging out stuff I don't want anymore. And quite often, I'll get to the end of a film, which maybe I've seen two or three times before, and in the end, I'm going to getting rid of it because I don't care about the characters. It's been fantastic talking to you. I, I, just a final note: your Bruce Robinson book. We we have to tell our Film Ireland people about your interview with Bruce Robinson because. Uh, he's got to be the most uh, errant writer I can think of. I always felt that he should have done even more than he has done over these years. Um, uh, two favourites of mine are Whitnell and Jennifer Eight. I'm also a big fan of Jennifer Eight. I, I think I can guarantee you that you and I both like Jennifer Eight more than Bruce Robinson does. Yeah, well, I know he had a, a lot of problems with how it was taken off him and changed. It's a very stylish film, and any Widnall fans listening to this who haven't watched Jennifer Eight, which is a... Um, 1992 yeah. um, Hollywood film that Bruce made. It was his third film as a director after Widnall and How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Um, fantastic cast. Um, Annie Garcia, Lance Henriksen, Kathy Baker, um, John Malkovich, uh, Uma Thurman. It's a serial killer film, but a serial killer film of a, with a kind of dialogue that only Bruce Robinson can write. Um, and he was he was working with the, the great late great um, American cinematographer Conrad Hall, uh, and the look of the film is absolutely beautiful. How did you get talking to Bruce Robinson in the first place? I did an interview with him for a student for a student newspaper, um, Bristol student newspaper. Um, that might have been around the time that Widnall. Uh, yes, it was. It was around the time that Widnall was re-released. Possibly the first time it was re-released, not even the second time. You know, dates me. Um, and um, it was, you know, it was, it was great. I, uh, I arranged it and I rocked up at um, um, 
the nearest station to where he is in the middle of the countryside. It was snowbound and he wasn't expecting me. And I phoned him, I said, you know, I'm here. And he said, oh, I didn't know you were coming. I, didn't you get my fax? No, 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 I didn't get your fax. So anyway, he, he turns out especially to pick me up in the, in the Range Rover and um, takes me back to his farmhouse. And we do this fantastic interview. I've still got the copy of Widnall, the script, the free copy that I got with Sight and Sound. It wasn't even a copy that I bought giving him royalties. Um, and I've still got that and I've still got his signature and the thing he wrote in it. Um, so then we did that and it was great. And um, then some time later, he um, published his novel, Peculiar Memories of Thomas Penman. And so by that point, I'd done a bit of film criticism for a film reviewing for Time Out, a bit of film book reviewing for The Independent on Sunday. Um, and um, I wrote to him and said, Jim, how about I interview you uh, about uh, the novel and he was like fine so I, I managed to land that with the observer one of those kind of q a style pieces um and then sometime after that i had the bright idea of doing a q a book with him this was at the point where faber were publishing a lot of these kind of things scorsese on scorsese schrader on schrader that kind of thing um and um i pitched it to bruce and in, in his in his usual generous way but slightly distracted way said yes great here's the person you need to talk to at bloomsbury so Okay, I toddled off to Bloomsbury and I'm like, that's a great idea. Um, I came cheap, but clearly I was a fan and Bruce trusted me. So, you know, off we went. Um, and I'm sure there were people that would have, uh, I was paid three grand to do it. Uh, and I'm sure there were people who would pay three grand to do it because I got to spend six weekends at Bruce's farmhouse. So I got to drink endless uh, glasses of red wine with him and uh, take a drive in his Aston Martin DB5. Um, silver with blue interior and no seat belts i didn't realize that classic cars don't have to have seat belts until i was tooling around the uh, very narrow uh, lanes near where he lives with very high hedges like oh my god but you know what a what a great what a great first book and because of that book and bloomsbury were really happy with that book they they kind of more or less did what you i suppose always hope as an author that a publisher is going to do and i suppose so few people are lucky enough to have it happen and they more or less said what do you want to do next and what i wanted to do next was an anthology of interviews with british screenwriters so thanks to bruce i could kind of have a career Excellent. yeah and i will never i will never cease to be grateful to him for that the style is, is similar you did, did the interview style did you go in for heavily prepared or did it come out because you knew the relationship was a bit more relaxed well as i say i i did i did low all that research at the bfi library for the, for the bruce book so i went in with, with you know reams and reams of stuff and loads and loads of questions um uh i mean he, it, it seemed to work. I mean, people have commented that uh, one review says something like the, 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 the interview is at clearly on Robinson's wavelength. And I think I think that's that's lovely to hear as an interviewer because it means you've done your job properly. Whether or not you are on their wavelength, I do happen to be on Bruce's wavelength um, to an extent, um, creatively, politically. Um, you know, he's he's he can be off the, off the chain sometimes, but in, in an entirely great way. Um, he's a fantastic writer. Um, as I said, it was no surprise to me that he ended up writing a novel because his prose style is so fantastic. I completely agree with you that it's a shame he hasn't done more. Um, he's a very individual um, writer. He writes what he wants to write in the way he wants to write it. He went on to do, publish his, his really quite startling book on Jack the Ripper, which he spent 15 years on. Um, so he's, and he's done, you could argue that he's done... Um, a great film as a director, which is with not a great film as a screenwriter, uh, just a screenwriter, which is Killing Fields, a fantastic autobiographical novel and um, a truly startling piece of nonfiction. And that's all things, all things in pretty, pretty damn good. I talked to him for the first time actually on the phone just the other day because um, 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 smoking in bed, um, the, the book of conversations with him is, a, is about to turn, it will be turning 20 in November. Uh, celebrating its 20th anniversary, which I can't quite get my head around. And he was rather shocked to hear it as well. Um, so I thought I'd, you know, give him a call. And, um, uh, you know, it's, I know exactly what to expect when I call Bruce and doubly so now, you know, when, when tri political times are so deeply troubling over here, I knew what, and, you know, we were both ranting and swearing away within, within two minutes, you know. Um, I don't, I, I would love to see what he might produce now. I sort of 
vaguely got the sense that, like me, he's so nonplussed politically that actually it's actually quite hard to write anything, that it's so unsettling, so crazy, that um, settling down to, to, to writing fiction feels feels difficult. It does for me, anyway. I you know to look at the world at the moment, it feels like there's some kind of crazy writer already ahead of the curve <laughs> writing reality. <laughs> Well, there was an idea I was, this is an original idea, there was an idea I was pursuing for quite a while, um, which would, I, I, I heard at one point that, um, I think I read somewhere, that the producers of the Omen trilogy originally had in mind a quadrilogy in which Damien ended up um, as president, but they never made it because the third film wasn't as successful as they hoped it would be. So I was sort of for a while with some friends developing that, as it were, unmade, uh, wouldn't be an Omen film, clearly, but you know. We, we, we um, jocularly referred to it as the devil president. And then we sort of talked about reviving it and then Trump came along and suddenly <laughs> what was going on in the White House suddenly seemed so much more ridiculous than, than the president being the son of the devil that we just abandoned it, you know? Sometimes fiction is, reality is so crazy that fiction can't keep up. Always, truth will always be stranger to, and fiction to quote an old cliche. Alistair, thank you so much for taking this time out to talk about the book. The book is wonderful. Uh, I hope it does really thank well. You. And I'll be talking to you when I've read your novel. I look forward to reading that too, The Vetting Officer. Oh, great. No, I, I, I hope you enjoy that one. Um, and this, you know. Thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. That was uh, very enjoyable. Talk to you soon.